Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the penultimate event for season two or day two of uh, Transmediale before we move to the HKV tomorrow. It's an immense pleasure and honor for me to share the stage with Amar Khan Geyser and Synthogen Varatharaja. I'd like to take a moment um, to introduce our two guests, although to some of you they need little to no introduction. Um, <clears throat> and then speak a bit about the framework and context of the conversation, its namesake installation upstairs in the Kupalhalla. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out the lighting, it's a bit difficult. Um, <clears throat> Synthogen is a political geographer, researcher, and essayist based in Berlin. Uh, their work explores many things. This is just a small taste. Uh, statelessness, mobility, and displacement with a focus on infrastructure, logistics, and architecture. Amar Khan Geyser is an award-winning geographer and sound artist working through listening and attunement to approach the relations between people, place, and ecologies. Over the past decade, they have focused on experimenting with sonic methods and practices, including field recordings, <clears throat> radio building and training, sonic ethnographies, oral testimonies, songs, sonifications, composition, sound walks, for environmental geographical research. These methods and their application have been developed through sound events with institutions and festivals, uh, of which there are too many to name <clears throat> at the moment. Um, since 2015, Amar has been collaborating with Pacific women, queer and transgender artists, organizers and scholars through Climates of Listening, an ongoing project that amplifies movements for self-determination in relation to continuing colonization, through resource extraction, environmental racism, and ecological disaster. This research emphasizes the nuanced and variegated ways that communities and people understand, produce knowledge about, and collectively attend to their lived experiences of ecocide. This has included running podcast production workshops with groups in Fiji and the Marshall Islands, <clears throat> for which an introduction um, to uh, for which an introduction to podcasting manual was compiled um, with the Fijian audio producers Mira Nila uh, Tikau and Crystal, pardon me, and Crystal Lavaki Danford from the Two Fishes show. Um, <clears throat> and I mention this also because Mira is one of the collaborators um, of of the show upstairs. Like refraction of light, a change in direction caused by a change in speed that is knowable and measurable once a ray of light enters water, in oceanic refractions, the installation and the conversation, uh, Almer and Synthogen will train their respective lenses on the politics of disaster visibility and the allure of environmental content to examine how images, ideas, projections, even fantasies of the climate crisis are leveraged and adapted to defer the responsibility for climate crises from global systems of violence onto acts of moral goodness to be done at the scale of individual, oh sorry, to be done at the scale of individual acts of moral goodness. Um, <clears throat> so staring into the space between how climate change is experienced and how it is imaged, we find the erasure of the causes and reasons for the unfolding ecocide along the so-called front lines. So perhaps we can start the conversation with a seemingly deceptively straightforward question, um, and we can start with Amar, and the format of the, of the conversation will really be quite um, loose and free-flowing um, as, as it goes throughout the hour. Um, so we'll start with a question for Amar. Um, how did the Oceanic Refractions project start and why? <laughs> Yeah, that is a very deceptively simple question that hides a lot in there. Um, so the Oceanic Refractions project, which is currently the installation that is playing in the Kupalhalle at the moment, is based on, um, I can't even, I'm not mentally cognizant to do the maths now. It started in 2015, so what is that like? 
five, six, seven, eight years ago now. Um, so nine years ago? I don't even know. Um, it started a really long time ago. It started in 2015, uh, and it kind of came through conversations that I was having with a group of queer and transgender grassroots organizers in Fiji around disaster relief. And in 2016, Cyclone Winston hit Fiji, and it was the worst cyclone to hit uh, the Pacific Islands in living history. It was, uh, it, it, it devastated Fiji and a number of other islands. And one of the things that I was working with the community groups around was the lack of accessibility and resources for transgender and queer people. And this was for a number of reasons, one of which was, you know, um, due to the legacies and histories of Christian missionization and moralism around transgender and queer people across the region. But so I went over there and was introduced to a lot of people that they were working with, along with another very uh, strident anti-colonial, anti-extractives group called Pang Fiji. And they put me in contact with a number of different grassroots, ad well, I guess like anti-colonial organizing across the region in Nauru, Papua New Guinea, the Marshall Islands, and in Kiribati. And probably for most of you here, you have no idea where those places are. And if you do know, it's you know maybe something that you know about islands that are sinking or people that are drowning, places that are no longer set to exist anymore. But you know there are very, very uh, militant and vibrant organizing movements that are happening there and have been happening through the decolonization process since the 1960s and 70s, and obviously well before then too. So I was put in touch with people and um, had the enormous privilege and pleasure to work with a number of elders and chiefs uh, in a number of different villages and places, uh, particularly around their campaigns against deep seabed mining. And a lot of our conversations turned very much to the role of silence and listening in terms of environmental kinship and relationality and the different kinds of ways of silence and listening that different indigenous Pacific cultures practice in order to be in what people like Métis scholar Zoe Todd calls good relation or right relation within community and within ecosystems. And so really this project Oceanic Refractions, which was co-artistically produced with Meren Alatikau, uh, who is an Itaukei Fijian, uh, and also Jumeli Tukota, who is also from Fiji, and Lea Sadev Lavaki, who are our filmmakers, and Joseph Kamaru, uh, who is the person we worked with with sound. Uh, it really came out of these oral testimonies that people sat and, and gifted me with in this process, and Mere as well. And so this project, Oceanic Refractions, has been planned and underway. You know, I mean, we really started building it uh, in the last 18 months, but it has been going as part of a very long continuing project that will continue very much so into the future in different iterations. Um, I realize um, some of you have had the opportunity um, to to um, uh, be immersed in the installation itself. Um, I know, Synthogen, you have. Um, and I wonder if you wanted to maybe maybe expand, or well, share maybe, um, some reflections on your experience, and uh, and especially considering um, what Amr has shared about you know how the project has come into being. Um. I think it was a very, of course, bodily experience in different layers and different ways, um, where you really experience um, the place as well as the circumstances um, through your own body while it's kind of being away from that very um, place where it's being filmed and the stories that are being told. Um, I thought it was a very like beautifully and touching but also devastating kind of testimony um, that reminds us also specifically here in the colonial metropolis of different relationships to our environments, you know, to the ocean, to land. There, was, there were really beautiful and quite um, stunning quotes and, and testimonies by different activists, teachers, writers. One of them, I think, was saying that um, in one of the indigenous languages, um, la land means people and people means land. And I, I really like the kind of like, um, exploration, it allows us to also under understand how language is a landscape, you know, and how 
um, European imperial languages kind of like train us also to consider and to kind of position us to, towards our environment in a particular way. But then once we allow to feel the environment through a different language that doesn't even have to be a written or a spoken language, um, I think it opens up entirely new gateways. And I feel like this um, installation really kind of like felt like a gateway that allowed you to feel without necessarily having to understand, but actually just experience and feel and respect whatever you wouldn't understand even. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful point and thank you so much. It's extremely meaningful to hear this from you. Um, and I know that everybody that you know has worked on this project would find it very meaningful to hear this from you too. Um, so the, um, what Synthogen is speaking about is a statement by a now um, past uh, Ikiribas poet and scholar um, Teveririki Tirero, and he talks about the wor word in um, Ikiribas Tiapa, which is the same word for land and for people. And um, Teveririki Tirero was a very important figure in the Pacific, so he took over the running of the Oceania Center at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji after the very renowned uh, <laughs> theorist and decolonization scholar Epeli Haufa, who speaks about our Sea of Islands and talks about how when the colonizers came to the Pacific, they spoke about the Pacific as um, islands in a far sea, as, as these small, tiny, isolated islands that really are meaningful only in their tininess and their minusculeness. And, you know, he speaks about that actually we are great ocean states and not tiny, tiny island states that really, you know, the islands encompass all of the oceans. And Apelli actually, however, you know, spoke a lot. Uh, he had very strong connections as well with decolonization movements around the world in the Caribbean as well, like other decolonization writers and thinkers that were thinking through the ocean and through thinking through oceanic uh, relationships and the ocean as an agent itself in the movement of people and, and the movement of ideas around the world. And I think specifically also speaking of where this is being, is being exhibited, you know, like and what it really means also in relation to this country and its own historic and present role in relation to these places and people. And I think it's very striking and important also and critical to kind of like bring also these um, realities into the forefront. Because I feel like a lot of times when we think about this particular part of the world from here, it's distant, it's abstract, it's very um, otherworldly almost, you know? And I think it's imagined and constructed historically also from here as the so-called end of the world, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I think in that sense, I think a lot of times there's a little bit of an, um, maybe embellished but also infantilized patronizing kind of like attitude towards you know like different living beings on these islands you know at the end at the same time um, the struggles are at the forefront and really leading and pushing a lot of notions you know like questions about like um, refugeehood you know like who is actually a refugee you know like there's so many like different kind of like struggles that really open up um, understandings of how we even relate to international law that people in these regions really kind of like open and um, are at the forefront at. Absolutely, and I think one of the, um, speaking directly to what you're saying, you know, one of the kinds of uh, distinctions that need to be made here, so there's a brilliant Pacific scholar who is sadly now also past, um, Tracy Benavanuama, who talks about the difference across the regions uh, in, you know, a Pacific, uh, wayfinding peoples, you know, people who always traveled, who always had this great mobility across the ocean, the difference in being forced to leave and choosing to wayfind, you know, like, and, and how acute that difference is, especially when at this point in time, you know, um, in states particularly like Tuvalu and Kiribati, you know, one of the big conversations that are being had is what does it mean to be forced to be a climate refugee to, uh, <laughs> to countries like Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand, where there is such a strong geopolitical hand that is played in the Pacific and I think that's something we'll come back to in a little bit as well is the geopolitics and the geoeconomics of that region in which Germany also plays a role but one of the things that I wanted to kind of say in terms of the representation of the Pacific in terms of environmental change is that there, you know, maybe what most people here would be familiar with is this idea of climate heroes or victims. You know, you see this media footage of people on the front lines as, you know, either 
the, on the worst day of their life, you know, like, or, or overcoming this extreme struggle, you know, and this is something that Mere has talked about a lot where she says, you know, it is, we cannot create work where we are showing the worst days of people's lives. And she was talking yesterday in a panel that we gave for CTM about uh, her background as a communication specialist across the region and talking about like after a cyclone, journalists coming in from Australia and, and elsewhere and saying, you know, standing in a village that had been devastated, you know, with the houses knocked over and, and the fields knocked over and saying, well, can you show us more devastation? You know, and this constant pressure on people within the region to show more and more of their trauma and devastation over and over again and to either be upheld as victims or heroes that are, you know, dealing with a disaster that is, quite frankly, of our making here in Europe and Anglo-European countries. You know, and, and I think that what people also, you know, that I spoke to spoke about uh, like there's a group called 350 Pacific, you know, this constant pressure to perform to the white gaze in the right way, to be discernible and legible to the white gaze so that people will pay attention or give money or offer support or change their behavior or pressure their governments into behaving differently. That is always this taking away of dignity. And what does it mean to actually speak to one's reality with dignity, not always to this, like, the gaze of the white donor that is, is coming in. And I think... You know, we made a lot of decisions about this project and, and one of the main decisions with the work for those who have seen it is you never get the opportunity to see black and indigenous bodies in this work. And that's a very specific decision because especially for white Europeans, being able to see that is a distancing measure. It's happening over there, it's happening to someone else, it's not happening to us and that is a lie. You know, the, the whole point of this work is about the interconnectedness of all of us that live on this planet and the understanding that all liberation is tied together and we can't actually achieve any liberation without that understanding of interdependence and interconnectivity. So I think really with this work and with these ideas, what we're trying to say is, you know, just as in Europe, everybody here has different ideas and different experiences and different desires and different things, so do people in the Pacific, you know, and it's People are full of contradictions and have different experiences and different perspectives, and that's also what we want to show. We want to show also the very <laughs> boring and mundane everyday lives that people experience even in the most terrible moments of disaster. People are still having birthday parties and still eating meals with their families and still, you know, celebrating one another and taking care of one another, and that is deeply at the heart of this work, is the care that people take of one another. Um, I think I want to um, actually pick up on something that you mentioned, um, which is this question of uh, distancing and the geo-economies at play um, underneath. Um, sometimes visible not so, and sometimes not so visible. And I wonder if you could um, maybe speak a little bit more about that, um, for, for especially for those who aren't aware of, for example, the role of uh, Germany, um, <laughs> or maybe we can just say Europe, um, or maybe Germany, um, in, in um, this particular kind of um, imaginary that's um, not only created, but um, sort of reified um, through through these images that um, that were shown. Yeah, look, I mean, I think for many of you know the audience, when you enter the space, the images are beautiful. The Pacific is beautiful. It's a beautiful place. You know, most people know it as a tourism. You know, and I think Synthogen can talk about this at great length in a little moment, like about the kind of allure of island states as touristic hotspots and that as a form, again, of capitalistic extraction. You know, this idea that, oh, this is a beautiful place to kind of go and have a beach holiday, you know, snorkeling, scuba diving, but also, you know, um, <laughs> within academia and the arts, a place where you can go and speak to people about, again, climate crisis, you know, a place for research extraction as well, you know, and, and I think that 
particularly from the European context, and um, you know, we've been talking about this recently, I think Synthogen and I also mentioned this, like Germany has very recently just opened up an embassy in Fiji after not having been there for a long time. So we always have to question why is this happening now? Why is Germany now interested in the Pacific again, you know? And I mean, Germany has been a colonizing state in the Pacific. In the 1800s and 1900s, Germany colonized Samoa. They annexed Nauru. You know, they were in Papua New Guinea. I mean, it's still called the Bismarck Sea in Papua New Guinea. You know, Germany was all over the Pacific. And Germany was also a country that started up plantations in Samoa and in Papua New Guinea and was very active in the blackbirding and indentured servitude of people to those plantations to do the work to send money back over to Germany. So Germany has been in the Pacific. And, you know, I really, <laughs> I really noticed this, like when I was in Nauru, um, someone was talking to me and they were speaking German like there were German words in that ruin and I was like what the f what the fuck like where am I right now and then we spoke about it and they're like yeah because Germany colonized us you know Germany was the country that started extracting phosphate from Nauru, which has ultimately led to the extreme environmental destruction of Nauru, you know um, where 80 percent of the island is now uninhabitable and that was a process that was started off by Germany and I think, you know, more broadly in this country, uh, people don't learn much about the other genocides that have been, you know, have been <laughs> activated through the German state. But the, the legacies and the histories and the traces are all still there, you know, very much in the Pacific as well, you know. And um, I'll actually, I'll pass it over to you. Um, picking up on that, I think um, in Germany specifically, I think a lot of the... Um, discussions around German colonialism, you know, like really um, reduced themselves geographically speaking towards the African continent. And there's very little interest and also um, research funds and other, um, yeah, just resources re really put into understanding um, Germany's role in creating what is considered the Pacific region. And also um, the kind of devastation and impact Germany still has, you know, and the kind of responsibilities Germany's actually never took and never responded towards, you know. And I think um, in many ways, like Germany got rid of that um, reality and, and the repercussions of that quite, um, yeah, smartly. And, um, and there's very little um, understanding either. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, the geographical distance that really also makes transport and communication um, so difficult and expensive. But then, and that also like adds up on the fact that a lot of the populations, um, like there's not a significant amount of, you know, like indigenous people and other people from these regions who actually live in these countries, in Germany specifically, which also means that there are rarely, you know, like um, community driven efforts, you know, of bringing it to the forefront, you know, at government levels or in other institutions. And I think that actually um, really shapes also how in discussions on German colonialism specifically, there's a clear blindsiding of this huge aspect and huge part of the world that Germany has colonized, you know, and where these traces are still very visible, um, but not necessarily um, acknowledged as they should be. Yeah, and I actually just wanted to say to that because it just it popped to my mind again. You know, I mean, I think the, the German relationship to, to this kind of like, again, it's, it's an artificial distance, you know, like it is not, there is not, Temporarily, and you know, there is there's not actually a distance there. Germans are there. The German embassy is there. You know, Germans are there on holidays. I think you were saying people just pop over to Bali. You know, mm. and things like this. Like, you know, but I I we found a review of the work the other day where, and I'm not saying this in any kind of mean way, but it was just very illuminating where the writer of the review re referred to it as the continent of Oceania, and just. I mean, it was a beautiful idea, and look, like, all of the Fijians were like, oh, cool, we're a continent, you know, but, like, that, that level of ignorance, you know, is just astonishing, and I understand it's in no way malicious, but it, it's just so profoundly clear. But I question the honesty 
of even um, pretending that there's an ignorance because when you go to flea markets or when you go into museums, you see all of that. In every single ethnographic museum of Germany, you find boats from you know, Papua New Guinea and other places. You, know, you find all these kind of statues, imageries, you find the souvenir postcards, you have everything you know, just laid, laid out there. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of actually publications even in German about these um, parts of the world, you know, and, um, and I think even like in the language, you find the traces in German, yeah. you know, like um, when we were discussing, yeah. um, I was speaking about um, the two terms that are used in both East and West Germany to denigrate um, um, guest laborers, Gastarbeiter in, in, in East Germany, it's Fiji, which is uh, used as a racial derogatory term to address specifically Vietnamese and North Korean guest laborers. And in West Germany, it was Kanake, you know, which from some Kanaki, uh, which was, is still used you know, as a racial de de derogatory term to describe specifically, um, well, I initially, people from the Mediterranean region, but now specifically Middle Easterners, North Africans, you know. And in that rhetorical kind of like reusage and reappropriation as well as uh, repurposing, you know, of forms of dehumanization and um, subjugation, you know, you understand that there's actually a memory that confronts this pretense of an amnesia. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it has to actually do with the fact that um, Germany, in many ways, as you were saying, you know, like it created these plantation economies, you know, um, enslaved, abducted people, you know, and a lot of these terms traveled through the labor relationships and they were then imposed on new laborers who were um, in the history from slavery to uh, endangered labor to um, contract laborers attached to that genealogy. And I think this specific kind of like rhetorical and um, semantic kind of like um, landscape really showcases also, you know, like how these words traveled because the words Kanake and Fiji traveled to German, you know, like colonists you know, who were um, taking these words and bringing them towards Hamburg, and then they were repurposing them, and the, the meanings changed, and then suddenly, at this point of history, you have, um, not necessarily in regards to the term Fiji, and I think this is what I find really frustrating, there's an abstraction of the actual people who exist. In this country, like, no one thinks about that Kanake are actually real people, colonized people, you know, by France, who are still fighting for the independence, and no one thinks about the fact that these people actually exist, and you have different populations, Middle Easterners and North Africans, who now reclaim, or call it a, a form of reclaiming, um, where they really um, continue this legacy of kind of writing out these people out of existence, yeah. and continuing their denigration yeah. by uh, pretending that they don't exist. I w and this also comes to, um, this also brings to mind some of the questions that I think we've talked about as well, I mean, individually and also together, um, is the question of um, legitimacy, um, the legitimacy of um, testimony uh, in particular. Um, and there's something um, happening um, in parallel here, and, and I think in, in parts of this conversation where there's this um, questions of legitimacy, of, of testimonies, of of erasure, of forgetting, um, and then the abstraction of those who may be able to deliver that testimony um, or who have already delivered that testimony and yet their sort of personhood um, is, is forgotten. Um, and I wonder if we could think about that in relation to the work itself because you said earlier you explicitly made the choice not to show bodies yeah. Um, to allow for that kind of gaze, but then I'm also thinking of the testimonies of you know non-human um, inhabitants um, of these places, and I'm wondering. Sorry, this is a bit of a <laughs> roundabout, but it'll make sense in a moment. Um, I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little bit more about the scent that you used um, and how that the scent, the scent yes, the scent, uh, in the room, <laughs> in the installation, um, and what, um, what that meant to you, why that was so important, um, and how that, I think, takes away a lot of that abstraction, um, for those who can recognize that scent. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll speak to a couple of different things. Um, one of the things with this project is, well, actually two, two things with this project is incommensurability and unintelligibility. And both those aspects are extremely important in this project because, you know, I'll, I'll just say this very briefly. So across the region, um, well, number one, across the region, there is no arts funding, right? So people do not have any opportunity to get funding from their governments to make the arts. That is just not a thing that exists. A lot of people who are filmmakers or musicians get roped into projects by the United Nations Development Program or the World Bank and other massive corporations to make uh, either kind of very touristically driven or you know, a very particular kind of representation of the Pacific in terms of sustainable development and the blue economy or to make virtual reality programs around climate change, you know, which is where you see children bereft of their houses and you know, it, it, all of the kind of trauma porn that people are very kind of familiar with. You know? And so one of the things that we worked very hard in this piece was to make sure that none of that was present. You know, it was very adamantly not present. And the ways that we kind of worked with that was, you know, we thought very much about disability accessibility in this work. Um, and we were thinking about, you know, should we subtitle the work so that people can understand? But we decided against it because we thought, no, the whole point of this is that particularly for white Europeans, <laughs> that we have to struggle to understand somebody else for once. You know, and turning this around into something where it's like, this is a question for us about how we listen, because one of the things, and we can also talk about this, is the kind of the moral virtue and the moral good, you know, particularly that countries that, like Germany, have this idea of themselves as environmentalists, um, hold of this idea of like we're caretakers of the planet and what other rot. But like, that was really something where we thought, you know, we did offer people transcripts because the work needs to be accessible, but really to play with that edge of intelligibility, that edge of being able to hear, you know, and also obviously sensorily through the body as well, because we don't just listen with the ears. But in terms of what you're talking about with the scent, um, after Cyclone Winston hit, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, who is a marine biologist, was asked by communities to go out to the island of Lao where the cyclone hit very, um, it made direct contact with land. And Lao is a small island uh, community, a small community there. And she was describing to us the smell of the beach after the cyclone, you know. And it was a smell that, uh, I, I grew up on a boat, I grew up on a boat in the Pacific and then also on a small island and it was a smell that was familiar to me. But the way that she described it is she was talking about the mutton birds and the frigate birds that had been washed up on the shore and the oily smell of the decomposing frigate birds mixed with the smell of the decomposing fish. And she said, you know, it was the first time that she had ever seen, as a marine biologist, so many species of fish washed on land. And she said, you know, it was like the contents of the sea had been put onto the land. And over the time that she was working there, you know, over a week, because she had to do all of these different, um, you know, like uh, counting things and stuff. Um, she was saying like the smell just grew and grew, like this very particular smell of death. And that was something that we really wanted to work with, the destabilizing smell of the ocean, not this like ocean that's a beautiful, you know, holiday ocean, um, this fantasy of the ocean, but the real ocean. And she actually wrote a wonderful poem about it um, in an audio piece um, that we made called um, In the Eye of the Storm. Uh, and she talks about it, you know, like the real ocean, my ocean, um, not your beautiful holiday ocean. And that was really where the smell came from, was trying to evoke that smell. And what's been really interesting in a lot of feedback that we've gotten from people is that you know, for, from people who come from other places that are really sea-based places, that particular combination of that petrol, mineral, rot, fish, seaweed thing also very much evokes like working harbors, you know, and, and actual understandings of the ocean, that like actual lived experiences of the ocean that people have. So yeah, there was a real interplay there continuously with like this kind of, view that is a, you know, like the facade and the reality of what is in there. No, no, I don't. 
Um, I think also, um, well, no, sorry, that's like actually a lot to think about. Um, I think with that also um, is this question of, um, sorry, intelligibility and incommensurability um, also brings us, uh, can bring us back to um, this question of the way um, the Pacific, but maybe not only the, the Pacific, maybe this is a question to open up more about um, islands um, in, in general, um, how they're represented in terms of, um, you know, um, not only um, environmental change, but also sort of like economies of representation, um, in particular um, on um, various um, platforms where they can be leveraged or instrumentalized, and I mean that, you know, in many ways, not necessarily positive or negative, not just a simple binary. Um, and I wonder, maybe, Synthogen, if you could talk about that a little bit more. Um, yeah, sure, I can, or I, I will try. Um, I always think about, like, islands, you know, like, as um, very specific places, you know, places that are very um, difficult to grasp for people who don't come from islands. And like I was saying, you know, like history is mainly written from so-called mainlands, not from islands. And people in islands oftentimes have to refer and are considered, you know, adjacent to a mainland. You know, it's mostly the mainland that also dominates the islands, you know, and it's that place that kind of has a grasp over everything that happens on the island. And island economies are at this point oftentimes also so deeply entrenched in industries of tourism that, and you've seen that particularly with the pandemic, you know, how unsustainable they became suddenly, you know, like when the planes stopped arriving and suddenly people had to kind of like turn into different modes of actually living and, and, and surviving. And I think um, nowadays, I think islands also in, in colonial histories are mostly the first places to be colonized, conquered, and the last places where the colonizers um, leave. You know, when you think about the uh, amount of formal colonies Europe, Euro Europe still holds, um, it's mostly island territories. The European Union technically stretches all the way to the Caribbean, all the way to the Pacific, and it's islands that stretch it. Um, I mean, so-called New Caledonia, Kanaki, you know, is a uh, case in point, you know, or St. Helena in the Caribbean and other places, or Réunion, you know, and there's so many, like, different um, examples where you really see how islands are territories that are completely contested, but also have now, at this point of history, also become completely dependent, almost resigned to this reality of dependency and an existence only through some um, foreign, distant capital. And... Um, and I think in the Pacific specifically, I think we keep on seeing, as you were saying, you know, like Germany opened a new embassy in Fiji, you know, and Fiji is also a place where many other countries also have embassies. And, it, and it's not necessarily because Fiji really plays this big, you know, like role, but rather because of the fact that um, China has emerged, you know, as a, as a party that is now really, um, um, well, has invested a lot, you know, into kind of like, um, outreaching, um, um, expanding the sphere of influence, but also um, undermining Taiwan, you know, as a, as, a, as a country that still tries to establish itself or, or separate itself, you know, from Chinese claims, you know, of annexation. Um, and a lot of these, these, these contests and these struggles happen actually in the Pacific, you know, with China um, and Taiwan competing uh, around investments into local economies, into infrastructure and other projects as a matter of fact of kind of stabilizing their own sovereignty and their claims. And these places suddenly become um, the battleground for a completely different region in the world. Yeah, and to, you know, to add to that, like the Pacific is still the place in the world that holds the most colonized states in the world today. You know, and I think that is a really profound realization considering that, again, the Pacific Ocean is a third of the world, you know, and that so many states are still held in these geopolitical strongholds particularly exacerbated now by the needs of states to kind of shore up finances for climate aid. You know, and, and one of the things, you know, that is talked about a lot is, 
you know, particularly amongst researchers is, oh, indigenous knowledge, like everybody's now getting really excited about indigenous knowledge. But the reality is there is absolutely no way that any of these states can do anything, any forms of adaptation and mitigation to actually hold back the intensity of, of what is coming again and again in terms of like cyclones and floods and droughts and coral bleaching and salination of soil and warming water. You know, like it's really something that cannot be contained by any one state. And I think, you know, um, this, this also ties very much horribly, ironically, you know, with the rush for the Pacific again now in terms of deep seabed mining, because what is being looked at to be mined is cobalt and iron and minerals that are used in renewable energy. You know, and so it is another form of greenwashing where countries around the world are rushing for the Pacific to buy up the licenses which they leverage through states like Nauru, which is economically a very dependent nation on Australian aid and different foreign countries' aid. And so Nauru goes into partnerships to have exploration licenses to different countries that come in. And, you know, I have to say, like, Recently, it was the Pacific Islands Forum and the Cook Islands, you know, people were handing out deep sea nodules to people that had come from as far away, like delegations as far away as Israel and Saudi Arabia coming into the Pacific to, you know, develop these partnerships that are ongoing anyway because they already exist through militarization. You know, the Pacific being a very important military base for the US and, as you say, China, Australia, other countries that are coming in I mean, the history of nuclear testing in the region in itself, you know? So there are all of these histories that are entangled with the impacts of climate crisis. And then on top of this, you know, the absolute pillaging of the ocean, not only through extraction for fishing and things like that as like one of the, you know, most verdant and last available fishing areas, but also now for deep seabed mining so that countries like over here, you know, we can talk about our renewable energy and look how good we are doing while we are mining the Pacific. I also think, because um, you were mentioning atomic you know, nuclear tests, yeah. I think um, a lot of islands are also testing grounds, yes. you know, and there are places where um, mainland countries and, and larger metropolises really like test out and play out, you know, like things that wouldn't have the same repercussions, you know, because they're contained in its impact. When we think about, for instance, now in the UK, the debate about offshore detention, for instance, I mean, so-called Australia was at the forefront of uh, creating these offshore detention centers in Manus Island and Nauru, you know, and um, they've closed them down, which also meant that Nauru now has like this huge, you know, like um, gap in its own um, GDP and, 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 and its, in its um, financial kind of viability. And I think, um, in that sense, I think it's also important to think about the fact of how, you know, like these places that look from here so remote on the map, you know, are actually so central to a lot of like world making and stabilizing of this um, imperial capitalist world order and how we cannot afford to actually write these places out of history and out of, you know, like the importance and meaning for our existence and a lot of times I feel like even in these climate debates there is if these places are being you know mentioned named you know and and even reported about it's not necessarily for the places themselves but rather you know like for what it means for us here you know so these places just become projection spaces mm -hmm. and they don't stand on their own and they're not allowed to even speak in their own you know and I think when the uh, Prime Minister of Tuvalu you know, like um, last year um, announced that Tuvalu will become the first digital nation and that they will um, upload Tuvalu into the cloud. You know, it was some um, were debating whether it was just a PR kind of, you know, like move or whether it's actually happening. But I think it is a response to the kind of like ignorance and apathy of this part of the world to actually do something. When we think mm -hmm. about what happened at COP28, you know, in the UAE, I mean, all the kind of like groundwork, you know, like that activists, you know, like thinkers, um, everyday people, you know, like we're doing in the Pacific Island regions, uh, fighting for a different world, you know, we're completely ignored by, uh, of course, an ironic or cynically held uh, climate conference in the UAE, you know, where uh, uh, change around fossil uh, economies were being discussed, but then uh, undermined by lobbyists. And I think that type of, um, I don't know, like um, just laissez-faire attitude, you know, like towards the Pacific, but also I think island nations in general, because I think even like in the so-called Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. you have similar, like the Maldives, you know, like in other places, they, they fight very similar struggles, you know, but these struggles um, are not necessarily, they're belittled oftentimes, because these populations and these economies are not as significant 
for these colonial metropolises? Yeah. Yeah, I think this question of um, of relation um, is an important one um, because it's a very um, it changes quite often, um, this sort of like, who is in relation to whom for what, right? So if we think about um, this question of, um, and maybe we can also talk about this a little bit more, um, this question of ecocide, for example, and trying to understand, you know, first of all, just grappling with what that term means, both actually, and then what does that mean legally within different contexts and frameworks, um, and who is deploying that term to what ends, um, to protect what, to 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 conserve, you know, what, for example. So I'm wondering um, if you, if you could talk about this maybe a little bit um, in the context of these particular um, or yeah, in your experience in these particular geographies, and then um, yeah, maybe we can expand the conversation yeah. a bit more. Absolutely. So uh, with Oce oceanic refractions, we have an advisory board of Pacific elders and. Um, other people who hold different sorts of uh, chiefly titles and things within the region. And, and one of our members of our advisory board is uh, uh, Fleur Ramsey, who works with Blue Ocean Law, which is an indigenous Pacific uh, law firm that specifically you know, works around issues of climate justice and social justice. And, and at the moment, they've been very actively involved in the petition that Vanuatu put together with 132 other nations to the ICJ around, you know, asking questions around the loss of life and damages due to climate change, you know, and, and are bringing this to the ICJ. And there are multiple, you know, I mean, I think, as you said as well, when countries become very dependent on donors and very dependent constantly on portraying themselves in a specific way to be legible and to be heard and having to walk as um, as many people have said to me the corridors of power you know i know for instance that a lot of pacific activists this year did not go to cop because the level of frustration and just grief of having to go and prostrate themselves over and over again you know i mean fleur also said in the talk yesterday that you know, in the Pacific, 98% of the reefs will be wiped out when we get to 1%, uh, one degree of rise, and we've already hit over 1.5. You know, and the amount of times that Pacific Islanders have had to go to these conferences and, you know, spaces of policy and law to say, you know, 1.5 to stay alive, like all of the different slogans in so many different ways, and nobody listens. You know, I mean, now perhaps talking about loss and damages, but how can you quantify the loss of an entire, uh, an entire place? You know, entire peoples just completely gone because of climate change, you know? And, and I think that's the thing. It's like, there are all of these different ways that people are trying to fight and trying to advocate and petition, but it's always coming back into the same kind of circuitry, you know? And ultimately, you know, when you speak to people in the community that are doing grassroots level work, you know, there, there is a complete loss of faith as well in any of these processes. You know, people know, we go, no one listens to us. You know, we go and nothing actually changes. And it's almost like the, the understanding of what is available, what is possible gets smaller and smaller and smaller every time, you know. And, and I know, like you said, with Tuvalu, you know, like to actually grasp, to actually grasp what it means for an entire country to feel like the only option they have left is to digitize themselves into the metaverse. You know, I, that is one of the, the hardest things, like when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's not even something that can truly be spoken about to grasp that incommensurable level of loss. You know, a culture and a society that has been around for like tens of thousands of years to just be, what, in the metaverse now, you know? And that is not a cynical ploy. That is not some kind of like, you know, well, this is us now. It's not some, you know, kind of, this is the reality of what people are facing. You know, and, and I think like when it gets so abstracted into these processes, yes, those are the processes that people feel are available to them, but the processes are rotten. Sorry, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> What I find interesting is that the disregard um, in regards to these, you know, like questions of survival of these island inhabitants, 
um, vis a vis if you juxtaposition it to how these islands are instrumentalized, for instance, in larger kind of like um, international state mechanisms, you know, like the UN, the Security Council, or the UN uh, Human Rights Council, you know, where a lot of the islands have similar, you know, like, I mean, the voting pattern or voting weight equates to the one of, you know, like of a little island, uh, equates to that of France maybe, you know, which also means that a lot of times a lot of these islands are also um, swayed, um, lured, you know, like into political maneuverisms that are then used to um, push for certain types of politics. We've seen that um, with China and Taiwan, but we, s we also see it, you know, like with Israel, for mm -hmm. instance, as well, you know, Israel also does a similar thing, you know, they have a historical relationship as being one of the first countries to recognize a lot of these new uh, independent island states, which also means that a lot of these island states feel a certain sense of gratitude and loyalty also towards Israel, which also means when you think about the UN Human Rights Council patterns in terms of like voting for ceasefires or not, you constantly see there's six Pacific Island nations that most people here even don't even know about mm -hmm. or don't even know where they are, or what they are, who they are, that constantly, you know, like vote um, in favor of maybe what also the US would vote for. Yeah, and I but I'll just interrupt and say specifically that, you know, I mean, I think for a lot of people, like when I spoke to people, they're like, what the hell is the Federated Stakes of Micronesia or why is Nauru, you know, like voting with Israel? And then as I said before, you know, if you think back to things like which, you know, the Pacific Islands Forum, you've got countries like Israel coming in and offering support to countries that are economically really beyond devastated, you know, and the ways that they uh, have the possibility of getting an economy again is through things like extractives, deep seabed mining. And when you have these other countries coming in and saying, hey, we will help you, we will give you money, you know, in communities where there is no, basically, an economy anymore, what are people meant to do? Mm. And I think it's a very, um, I guess on the flip side, you have other, you know, like, um, examples like, for instance, West Papua mm -hmm. being colonized by Indonesia, you know, and Indonesia being one of the first proponents and supporters of Palestine, mm -hmm. who then also support um, the ICJ um, uh, court case and also have also submitted their own court case, you know, whilst, you know, like being the colonizers of West Papua, you know, mm -hmm. and doing terrible things on an everyday scale that no one really recognizes, knows about, hears about, because these places are so abstracted. And even in solidarity movements, you know, in leftist kind of like organizing here, there's very little space, acknowledgement, uh, even interest in these places yep. because they're so removed from the mental yeah. An emotional landscape, and I think that is such a devastating and tragic state. Yeah. I mean, the silencing, particularly in Europe, about West Papua, which has been, you know, the the resistance has been going on for so many decades now. You know, like that is such a a huge kind of thing as well, particularly in the relationships with Indonesia, you know, and the particular fantasies around Bali as well. Like you were saying, you know, that's these points. There's always these points of erasure these points that people kind of like, you know, block out in a certain kind of way for different kinds of reasons and different kinds of strategic and geopolitical reasons as well. How much time do we have left? <laughs> um, it's three, yeah. three minutes. Three minutes. Do you want to do one more question? No, <laughs> we can end now. Okay. Um, okay, I will defer to you. Um, Thank you both so much um, for for your time. Um, thank you both so much for um, meeting tonight in particular um, and sharing um, both of your work um, so so generously um, and so beautifully. Um, in particular, upstairs, it's it's really incredible. If you do, I, I know it's I know it's sold out. I think, um, but um, if you do have the chance to sort of wait by the door if someone doesn't show up, um, do do try to see it, or hopefully we'll see it in future iterations somewhere not so far away. Um, if you want actually more information, um, you can um, go to the project website. Um, you can go to CTM's website, of course, uh, but then there's the project website, oceanicrefractions.org, and I will leave it there. Thank you all so much. Um, we will have another conversation in just um, a few moments as well. So thank you. <laughs>